anyway, Chris, Christy is um, a founding board member of the Native Bee Society of BC, and she has a BSc in Environmental Science and Biology from Trent University, a Master's in Horticulture from Pennsylvania State University, and a PhD in Landscaping from the University of Sheffield. And Christine is an instructor at Kwantlen Polytech University and lives on the unceded Squamish territory in North Vancouver. And welcome, Christine, and go ahead. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I'd be very happy to share my screen, but I think I need to be made. Oh, no, I don't. Let me go right to it then. Um, I should clarify, um, I have a PhD in landscape ecology, not landscaping. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, well, I guess with no further ado, let's see if I get myself set up here. First of all, happy World Bee Day, which we are jumping the gun a bit, but I'd like to think we're just warming up. Um, I'm going to set my timer so that I can keep an eye on things. So yeah, I'm really happy to be uh, with you uh, this evening. Um, hope to share what I am able to share. Um, and yeah, so the talk is um, ecology in the city. And um, yeah, looking at how all of us who live in settlements can support our bees. Um, yeah, so um, this is a full disclosure. I am a plant person. Um, so this is me doing, uh, this is one of my PhD research sites. I was looking, doing vegetation and soil surveys on some of the oldest green roofs in the world. Uh, this was in Germany. Um, I do teach the green roof and living wall courses at BCIT. And I'm an instructor, I'm a faculty in uh, science and horticulture at KPU. Um, so there might be other KPU folks in the audience, uh, Lisa being at least one. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, that's quite a new post for me. I just joined uh, the school in September. But um, yes, and of course I'm representing the Native Bee Society. Um, uh, the disclaimer is I am a plant person and I, I have always been passionate about bees and so what I'm sharing here is what I've learned and I'm continuing to learn as I'm sure we all are. Uh, so if any of my colleagues have arrived in the meantime, um, I do welcome others to, to pipe up if there's something that I'm not able to answer. So I don't claim to know everything. Um, but this presentation was put together with, uh, with my colleagues as well. So it has been uh, fact checked and everything. It should be up to speed. So in about 40 minutes, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the Data Bee Society. Uh, then we'll do some explorations on how we can celebrate and know wild bees. So you may come away having learned something. Uh, and then we'll look at um, how green infrastructure can support native bees. I am using wild and native interchangeably here. And if you do have any questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hands. Um, I'm not sure with the screen the way it is, I might not be very responsive, um, but I shall do my best. And maybe Lisa, um, or I'm not sure Lisa, if you're moderating or if someone else is, but maybe you can support me on that. So the Native Bee Society is quite a young society. Um, this picture is from our founding AGM in November, 2019. Um, and yeah, it, we are a collective of scientists, artists, managers, and enthusiasts working to promote the conservation of native bees in British Columbia. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a very dynamic group, as you can imagine. Uh, and our offerings are diverse, as diverse as is our membership. Um, so we are doing online and now getting back into in-person events. Uh, we have a monthly bee study group that my colleague Bo Bonnie tells me is going very well. We're also part of the Master Melatologist program, which is through Oregon State University, uh, through their um, the Ag Extension group. Our friend Andoni Melopoulos and Link Best 
our connections there. And Link is a board member with the Native Bee Society. So that's for master melatologist is like master gardener for bees. So it's a great way to really learn your stuff in a um, kind of a supported um, self-paced context. Uh, we also do citizen science. We have an iNaturalist project. Um, and of course we do workshops and really looking forward to getting back into field trips. So that's the society. So let's get into the, the good stuff, celebrating and knowing wild bees. So quick poll, how many bee species are native to British Columbia, do you think? So you could put it into the chat maybe. Um, I don't have a poll ready to go. I don't see the option for that anyway. Um, yeah, so how many species are native to BC, do you think? Five, 50, 200, or more than 400? So you could just put your, put your chosen number into the chat. Okay, it's starting to populate. Looks like we got some good smart people out there. I'm gonna move to the next slide. So there are more than 590 species of bee recorded from BC. Wow, right? And the reason is, as we all know, BC is a diverse province. Just think of all those biogeoclimatic zones. Um, bee wise, 450 bee species are recorded just from the Okanagan uh, and over 500 with associated sequence data. So that has to do with the, um, you know, the fine tuning taxonomy. taxonomy. Um, so this, this graph kind of uh, gives you a sense of how the different biogeoclimatic zones, um, actually these are, these are geographic zones. Obviously uh, the diversity of the habitat uh, relates to the diversity of the species. So let's just look at uh, native bees as an overview and then we'll get into a bit more detail. So native bees come in all colors of the rainbow uh, from metallic greens to fuzzy orange and purples to metallic blue and complete black. Um, another key thing about native bees is that they are predominantly solitary. So whereas honeybees, which is the, the bee that most people are familiar with, that's a social bee, uh, in terms of our native species, less than 10% are social and about 90% are solitary. So of those solitary bees, um, they nest in cavities, they nest in the ground. We'll look at the, those a bit more closely. Yeah, in fact, ground nesting bees often use patchy lawns. So if you have a lawn that's crappy, <laughs> uh, if you keep it organic, and if you mow and irrigate um, with awareness, bees will love you. Um, actually, this is a little video, so keep your eye on this bee in the top. So you can see it's just sand and uh, kind of well-drained soils are great for ground nesting bees. And the reason that you mow and irrigate with awareness is that these are, um, you can imagine there's important landmarks for bees. When they arrive at the end of the day and everything's been mowed, they won't see their landmark dandelion or you know, sand patch. So it's just useful to be mindful of um, that there may be bees in, your, in the soil outside your house or wherever. So we can, um, Obviously with so many species, it's helpful, helpful to break them down into functional groups. So um, we're just gonna look briefly at some of these major functional groups. So the bumblebees, the hairy belly bees, the pollen pants bees, and then there's actually lots of other neat bees too. So everyone knows bumblebees, right? Um, genus Bombus. So as you know, they've got fuzzy bodies, but they can be very colorful. They could be black, yellow, amber, white. Um, there's 32 species of bumblebee in British Columbia. And this is actually our only true social native bee in BC. 
and they're excellent pollinators. And the reason is that they do buzz pollination. So they actually like vibrate uh, when they're on the flower and they carry the wet pollen on their tibia, which is uh, their front leg, I believe. Uh, and they can build colonies of 60 to 200 individuals and it's all based around that one queen. So again, our only social native bee. Then we get to the hairy belly bees. Um, and there's a number of different genera. Um, some of you might know Osmia, that is um, our blue mason bee or the orchard bee, I should say. Um, in any case, these hairy belly bees typically have large mandibles. Look at the guy at the very bottom there, huge mandibles. Um, and that's because they, they nest in cavities. So they actually need uh, equipment to be able to um, kind of drill and dig. So they nest in cavities or in the ground and they actually use a wide range of nesting substrates, including the mason bee boxes as mentioned. We'll get to the boxes. Um, another functional group is what we call the pollen pants bees. So these include mining bees, sweat bees, polyester bees. Um, so this green one at the top, uh, Agapostamon texanus, that's like one of the only wild bees that I really know because it's so green. Uh, there are many species, there's around 14 uh, genera. And some of the ID characteristics are that the female carry dry pollen on their legs and they're small to medium sized bees. So if you've ever seen a small bee, they can be really small. Um, and these bees are mostly uh, ground nesting, uh, except for the one, the Serotina, she nests in the pith of Rosaceae. So um, many plants in the Rosaceae family um, have just the right kind of stem that uh, with the, the right kind of pith that they're able to excavate uh, without too much problem. And then there's lots of other neat bees. Um, uh, just featuring a couple here, couple here, there's the masked bees. These are small black bees with white or yellow face markings. Um, also the cuckoo bee, which is quite interesting. Uh, they are kleptoparasites. So they actually parasitite uh, parasitize uh, the broods of other bees. And in fact, they often have a specialist relationship with a particular genus or family of bees. Nevertheless, even though, uh, you know, we, we automatically want to think that a, a parasite is a bad thing for an ecosystem, um, these are actually indicator species, and they're even of high conservation concern. <clears throat> so that's the cuckoo bees. Okay, now we're gonna do a quick fun game for your little brains to warm up to this. So celebrating and knowing wild bees, is it a bee or is it not a bee? So I'm gonna show some images and then you're gonna have a quick quick chance to just kind of see what, what comes up for you. So bee or not a bee? And I'll do it pretty fast. So just, just uh, use it in your mind. This is not a bee. This is a wasp. Okay, another one. Bee or not a bee? It's shiny, but look at those antennae. This is not a bee. Uh, it's a kind of fly, I believe. Okay, bee or not a bee? What do you think? This one is a bee. Uh, and this is, a, again, an agapostamon, but Ceraceus form bee. So here's a comparison of the, the last two that we looked at, nice shiny green, but the one on the left is a bee, the one on the right is not a bee. And just looking at it, you kind of get a sense of the differences, right? Um, so we'll look at those um, in a table form. Um, so the most easily confused are gonna be wasps and flies. So if you're comparing wasps versus bees, so here you kind of see how it breaks down. Um, first of all, their diet, bees are herbivorous, whereas wasps are carnivorous, as we know, they crash barbecues, especially in the, in the late summer, right? But then you get to the anatomy as well. So bees are quite curvaceous, they're often hairy, um, and because they're collecting pollen, right? 
So wasps, by contrast, they're not curvaceous. They're, they're narrow body with a slim waist, right? They're very, um, very athletic looking, um, kind of like warriors, you know? Uh, they're not very hairy uh, because they don't need to collect pollen. That's not part of their remit. Um, also, their, their legs are different. Bees have stout legs with few spines, whereas wasps have long legs with spikes, long thin legs. And then of course there's movement too. You can look at the habitat uh, and understand whether it's a bee or a wasp or a fly for that matter. So for bees, um, females will move between flowers, right? When they're foraging, whereas um, the males would be traversing for females. That's sort of like their, their lot in life. Wasps, by contrast, if they're moving around, they're searching for prey. This is a carnivore that's, you know, moving around looking for uh, prey, which is quite a different sort of behavior from moving between flowers, right? Um, and some wasps also have twitchy antennae. There you go. Um, flies are also easily confused with bees. And there's um, some um, basic ways that we can distinguish them. So the pictures here taken by my colleague Marika, the top one is a bee and the bottom one is a fly. So the, the antennae, in the case of bees, they're long and slender. Flies are very short, right? They're generally like little stubs coming right up the top of the head. Um, again, the pollen collecting hairs are unique to bees, uh, certainly by contrast with flies. Flies do not have pollen collecting hairs um, on their legs or bellies. Uh, and here, the placement of the eyes is also um, a good point to look at. So bees, their eyes are on the sides of their head, whereas flies, of course, they have huge eyes. They're huge, and sometimes they touch on the sides of the head. They almost define the head. So those are some very quick uh, distinctions. See if you can try them out in the next couple of days. And here's a, here's a comparison. Uh, you can see the antennae really nicely, and also the eyes, the size of the eyes. Um, I guess you probably all know about uh, biomimicry, how some species or genera will imitate how other species or genera look. Um, so this fly kind of looks like it's, it's definitely imitating a bee. Okay, so that takes us to um, native bees and green infrastructure. So what is green infrastructure? Um, so I specialize in green roofs and living walls and sustainable landscapes. Um, but actually green infrastructure is a general term. It applies to basically any soil and plant in the built environment. That's my loose translation, whether it's on a green roof, whether it's um, you know, a, a garden, whether it's a beautiful wisteria arch, including whether it's your own garden whether it's the urban forest, uh, local green spaces, this all qualifies as green infrastructure. And that's how I framed it uh, in this talk. And the, the key thing is that if it's designed well, green infrastructure or GI can support biodiversity. So this picture from one of my colleagues in Switzerland of the green roof kind of being like an elevated part of the, the greater landscape is sort of the vision, right? That's the ideal. Um, the fact of the matter is green infrastructure is designed and built, it's constructed. So um, hence, if it's not designed well, or if it's not designed with biodiversity in mind, it may not actually support meaningful biodiversity. So that's what we're gonna look at uh, for the rest of this talk. So the real question is how can green infrastructure benefit native bees? And as you probably all know, bees ha have been suffering um, over the last couple of, couple of years, uh, more than a couple of years at this point. Um, you know, it started with uh, the colony, colony collapse disorder, right? Remember everyone is so afraid, like what is going on? Is it the power lines? Of course it was the pesticides, it was the, the mites, the pathogens from kind of farming honeybees too hard. Um, but, 
anyway, so we, we know what the, the main pressures are. So if we can actually target what those pressures are, whether it's in our own green space, whether it's in any green space that we have any agency over, uh, we can help our native bees, our local bees for sure. So it's broken down into four, um, four major pressures. Um, and I believe, I'm trying to remember where I got this from. I think it's from Xerxes, which is the great um, charity for um, invertebrates. Actually, just to direct your attention to this, this poor little bee that my friend Jasna took, you can see she's covered in mites. Do you see all those um, dots on her back there? She is being, uh, kind of makes me think of like <laughs> salmon, you know, when they're covered in sea lice. Oh, I was just reading about that today. Uh, but varroa mites are kind of known to be a, a real problem for honeybees. Unfortunately, these can then um, pollute uh, the wider ecosystem as well. Uh, so this is how bad it can look when a bee is just completely covered uh, in mites. So let's get to those four points. So habitat is obviously the key thing for most species today. Um, and in the case of habitat loss, well, let's talk about what we can do uh, with our green spaces. So let's provide forage, right? Forage is food. Um, and of course, for bees to be healthy, they need nutritious food. So in that regard, say you've got a garden or a green roof or a green space that you're allowed to plant into, well, you wanna provide plantings that offer both pollen and nectar. So that's a really important thing to understand about plants is that some plants only offer nectar uh, like blueberries, I believe, offer a lot of nectar and like zero pollen, which for a bee is kind of like, oh, I'm just going to drink Coca-Cola all day and it's going to keep me going, but there's no pollen to kind of like actually keep me healthy. Um, similarly, pollen um, has, has different grades of value. So having a, a nutritious um, landscape uh, is one step you can do. And of course, having diverse plantings is part of that too, part of providing that nutritious forage. Um, so there's a picture here of a, a lovely pollinator garden with, you can see a, a variety of, of woody plants. That's obviously red flowering currant. Uh, I'm not even sure what the other plants are. Uh, but yeah, just kind of like diversity in terms of uh, your species and also how you place them. You can actually, um, you know, native uh, pollinator gardens often have um, sort of a naturalistic look to them. Um, and the reason is to make them more attractive and useful to bees so they don't, they don't have to travel too uh, far to, to find what they need. Yeah, I, I did wanna emphasize the part about nutrition, actually. Uh, nutrition is the essential key when we talk about providing forage for bees. Uh, so I don't know if any of you have heard about No Mo May. Uh, it's, I believe it started in the UK actually. And from what I've seen there, it's fantastic. People are encouraged, you know what? Just don't May, don't mow in the month of May uh, to allow all the wildflowers um, to provide forage for our early bees. The bumblebees are often the early ones to come out. And, you know, if we're, if we're mowing the first flowers, we're really cutting down into what they can, uh, sust what sustains them. So this new piece just came out uh, in this link here, which I can share in the chat later um, if you're interested, um, that actually uh, Nomo May is a little, it, there's a bit of nuance to it uh, because there's this new hashtag as well called lazy lawns, which um, is kind of like, oh, we'll just let the lawn go do whatever it wants. But actually um, it's been discovered that dandelions, are, are actually like junk food for bees. So the, the pollen is protein deficient. And on top of that, the pollen is allelopathic for native plants, which means that the pollen of dandelions inhibits the germination of native plants. So it actually has quite an impact on the, on the greater ecosystem. And, and actually maybe no mome is too simplistic. Maybe it's too simplistic to just say, oh, just leave the dandelions, they're great. What would be great would be a huge diversity of native plants offering a whole diversity of nutritional uh, value. So I wanted to get that in there because that's quite a new, quite a new uh, thing that's just kind of circulating. Um, another point on habitat and forage is thinking uh, across time. 
that you've got early forage and late forage so that you can actually provide bees with food throughout the year, starting as early as April and going all the way until September, October, maybe November. Uh, so this is an example of a wildflower meadow plant list with bloom times that uh, my colleague Marika, she's the outgoing vice president of the Native Bee Society. She put this together for the Renfrew Ravine. Well, I guess it's not the ravine, it's the Renfrew Wildflower Meadow. Uh, this is in East Vancouver. And you, you can see how um, you can actually ensure that you've got a con consistent flowering period, uh, that, that this is an effective wildflower meadow that will serve bees from the very beginning of spring right through to the end of, of autumn. Okay, and then I think, I think this is the last point about forage, and that is make sure that it's safe. So pesticides are the bane of the existence of all insects. Um, and as you probably know, neonicotinoids are a class of, um, of pesticides that are having cat catastrophic effects on um, not only bees, but all insects. Um, pesticide contamination is widespread. Um, it's sprayed on plants, um, which can then lead to contaminated pollen and nectar. And also the ground is sprayed as well. And in BC, our forests are sprayed. Everything is sprayed. It's absolutely bonkers. Um, so, you know, it's um, it's it's up to us as citizens to, to really call to ban neonicotinoids. Uh, Vancouver, city of Vancouver actually did ban them um, just a couple of years ago. Uh, the EU banned them and then they kind of came back. And yeah, it seems like it's it's quite um, it's quite a big ask, um, which is largely because it's a Monsanto um, product is my understanding. They just have a lot of clout. So bees don't have voices, unfortunately. So that is one thing that we can do and obviously ensuring that our, um, our offerings are pesticide free. Okay, then, um, you know, talking about habitat loss. Okay, well, what about habitat creation? What can we do in that regard? So we can provide homes and materials for nests. So you'll probably remember 90% of bees are solitary uh, and they, the majority nest um, in cavities and under the ground. So here's some examples of nesting uh, materials or even nesting sites um, that, that we can consider creating depending on, on our, our resources and where we are. Okay, John asked, are codling moth sprays using neonicotinoids? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think that's a question for the, the web. If I was not speaking right now, I'd do a quick web search to look that up. Yeah, it's a good question. Ne I, I do know that neonicotinoids are a huge class of pesticides with a number of different, um, different pesticides within them. So I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so for nesting material and sites, so colony builders like the, hunt, uh, the bumblebees, um, they will use old rodent burrows, they will use thatched ground, they'll even use bird boxes. And you can see in the picture there, um, these are little, um, what they called, not honey pots, but they're basically little nectar pots that the, the queen bee um, prepares for her brood. Uh, and that looks like a, an old bird, bird's nest. Um, for above ground nesters, um, yes, yeah, so like the cavity nesters, this is a nice example of this middle picture here of uh, a cavity nester in a stem. So you can see the, the, um, the bee has built these little cavities, these little cells where she basically lays the eggs with a little um, store of resources uh, so that when they, when they hatch, they have something to eat and then they eventually make their way out of that stem. And of course it's timed perfectly somehow because they're magic. Um, yeah, so those could be trees and shrubs, but also logs and grasses. And also, you know, bees will require other materials like mud or leaves or resin. Uh, so this typically um, would include mason bees and leaf cutter bees. If you ever see um, 
green leaves with these perfect circles cut into them. Those are probably leaf cutter bees that have cut these little circles and then they that's what they that's how they build their their cells for their broods. As you can imagine, if that leaf is covered in pesticide, they're ingesting the poison. Um, yeah, that's pervasive. Um, and then here's the underground. Oh, this is a little video. Let's see if this one works. Yeah, so again, the, the ground nesting bees, often bad lawns. So bare ground, sandy soils. Um, it really, I feel like this is uh, the antidote to the North American obsession with lawns, right? It's like, wow, there is so much potential in crappy lawns. So yeah, mining bees and sweat bees will use um, uh, our ground nesters. Okay, and maybe you're wondering, well, what about nest boxes? Because these are increasingly becoming popular. Um, so we encourage us to think twice. So cavity nesters can take care of themselves. Um, and the, the, the reason that is pertinent is that nest boxes must be rigorously maintained. Otherwise they risk introducing pathogens into the environment. Um, so, you know, a, a nest box is kind of like a, a mini honeycomb. You don't get honey out of it, but you do need to maintain it. So you need to, to clean it properly every, every autumn. Um, you know, put it in the freezer, da da da. Like there's there's maintenance to it. It's not just something that you put out uh, into the world and, um, well, hope for the best. Yeah, and the other possible risks there is that um, these these nest boxes may inadvertently domesticate wild bees. Um, you know, I find it really sobering to consider that the the European honeybee which was wild at one point, there are no wild populations of Apis mellifera in Europe anymore. Um, they're completely kind of domesticated as it, as it were. I've heard some pollination ecologists refer to honeybees as honey cows actually. Yeah, so just think twice about nest boxes. It's, you know, it's a real responsibility. Uh, consider it maybe not on par with like getting a puppy, um, but there's definitely responsibility associated with it. Yeah, and as mentioned, if you've got a crappy lawn, that's great. Um, yeah, so the timing of your maintenance, you know, if, if there are dry sandy areas where the vegetation is patchy, well, that may well be favored by ground nesting species and probably we won't have a clue that, that they're there unless we sit and stare and watch for hours and hours and hours. Um, so we could, if you've got a patch of, yeah, like dry sandy areas where the vegetation is patchy, you might consider like, well, maybe benefit of the doubt, maybe there are bees that use it. So what that means is if you're going to mow that lawn, time any landmark changing maintenance uh, for after the bees are safe in their burrows, just so that they can reorientate when they come home from forage. All right, I'm not sure exactly how that works, but yeah, basically just be mindful of, of um, the days, you know, the, the type of the day and what the bees might be up to. And I think the last point is water. Water is life. Um, this is a habitat pond that I uh, designed and built, and I was so, surprised that it was covered in bees. Um, you can see the, the bee on the, in the center there, her tongue is out, like she's drinking. Um, every time I would go soon after we installed it, it was full of bees and they were just bathing and drinking and, and it makes sense, right? Water is life and insects need water too. So um, yeah, obviously we don't want them to drown though. So it's similar to having a bird bath or a pond where if, it, if anyone fell in, they can get out um, safely. Yeah, so now um, I thought uh, we'd just look at um, an example of BC green infrastructure and um, how it works for native bees. So I thought we'd look at the, the Vancouver Convention Center, which is obviously uh, quite a large green roof. In fact, it's the largest non-industrial green roof in North America. Uh, it was planted in 2009, I believe, uh, with all native species. 
Um, I was actually working for Nat's Nursery at the time that the, these plants were being grown and it was a huge, huge project. <clears throat> so in terms of, you know, what has this project done well? Well, all those native plants are a really good step in the right direction. Uh, there are a number of bulbs, including camas, and bees love camas. Uh, it's just a, a really great plant. And there are still a, a good number of camas on that roof. Uh, I took this picture in 2019, I think, <clears throat> pre-COVID. Um, also, I think this is a brodea, one of the uh, one of the other bulbs that was planted, they are still present. So of course, bulbs are great because they provide that spring, um, that early spring pollen and nectar. Yeah, so the fact that it was planted with species native to coastal BC, that's a huge plus. Um, also, it's irrigated with gray water from the building. Um, the convention center is a lead platinum building, so it's basically hyper green. It's like as green as it gets. Um, any water arriving into that building is treated on site um, and irrigated uh, with a drip irrigation. So what that means is that the vegetation on the roof actually stays green in the summer. It doesn't go dormant. Uh, and of course, if you have active um, plants, you've got m many more resources available, as well as that the green roof is you know, cooling the air uh, as well. And of course, it's quite a sloped roof um, with a number of gradients of both moisture and aspect. Uh, so that, that diversity of habitat is a really good feature uh, for uh, diversity in general. So some of our colleagues from the BD Biodiversity Museum at UBC, uh, the curator, in fact, Dr. Karen Needham, she and her colleagues um, did three seasons of entomological surveys on the Convention Center Green Roof. Um, this poster was published, uh, I think in 2019 actually, uh, and it's available as a PDF uh, from the BD, I believe. Um, and so over those three seasons, they cataloged over 250 species of insects. Uh, with regards to bees, they found five species of bumblebee, um, and eight solitary nests from three different families. So I think the next slides, I kind of um, show the poster in snippets, a little bit more detail. Um, so April, May, June, uh, I don't believe the, the pictures necessarily relate to the pictures in the center, um, but you can see obviously the, the bees here on the left and um, everything from crane flies to a um, whole range of different flies. There were also some species that were new to BC. Um, yeah, I think they even did evening. So you can see this September, the dark image on the bottom in the center. They did some evening um, just to kind of get the moths as well and all the night flying insects. Okay, yeah. So with regards to this particular roof, um, you know, there might be ways that this could be improved uh, for biodiversity or for bees in particular. Um, so one is the vegetation management is it's such a huge site. Um, there are areas where there, there are invasive species that are kind of getting, they're, they're, they seem to be spreading. I've not been up uh, since the pandemic. Um, so there is some, there could be some more refined uh, vegetation management. Um, they basically do a big mow every autumn and they take a truck of biomass away. Um, so to me, it's kind of like, I wonder if like, oh, maybe there's a different way that we could do that. Even, you know, the fossil fuels of having these trucks and um, kind of shifting all that biomass. Could we mow it in strips? Could we even introduce herbivores up there like sheep is what I'm thinking, actually. Technically, I did talk about it with them. Um, the elevators in the convention center are big enough for horses, so surely they could have sheep. Um, and then the other idea, sort of that central point, I kind of jumped around there, is you know habitat for native bees and insects. Well, what about providing like basking areas, you know, sandy patches, gravel patches, um, nesting materials? Just some ideas. So in closing. 
you know, why is this all important? World Bee Day, so what? Well, this is an image that I always go back to. It really impressed me when I first came upon this report in 2012, which is, oh my gosh, 10 years ago now. But um, this was the, the Cities and Biodiversity Outlook Report by the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. And in 2012, of the area predicted to be urban, by 2030, 60% had yet to be built. Um, so for anyone working in the built environment, uh, whether it's in green roofs or um, green spaces, urban forestry, uh, this is a, to me, this is a call to arms, like let's make sure that we're speaking up uh, for those who don't have voices. Yeah, because bees don't have voices and they need our help. They help us so much, right? Without them, we wouldn't have any food. Um, and actually towns and cities offer many possibilities. You know, Vancouver doesn't have neonicotinoids in circulation. Um, so that's a real, a real boon for, for pollinators. So yeah, I invite all of us maybe for a World Bee Day to just really take that on board um, that we can speak up for bees needs uh, in wherever we have agency. So World Bee Day is officially uh, Friday. Oh, it's tomorrow, May 20th. And I just thought I'd mention as well, World Green Roof Day is uh, June 6th. This is a picture of an excursion that I organized uh, in 2019. And just so that you know, I'm really excited about this World Bee um, Workshop, World Bee Day Workshop that my colleague, Lori Weidenhammer and I are doing along with Sinaquila Weiss at Maplewood Flats on Saturday. So this is a free um, event. Lori knows so much about bees. So I'm just really excited to be, be there with her. And Sinaquila knows so much about plants. Um, so I'll, I'll be happy to share whatever I can, but really I'll just be absorbing. So that's from 11 till one at Maplewood Flats in North Vancouver. And I can put the link in the chat if that's, if that's of interest. And that's, that's everything. And wow, 40 minutes and 20 seconds. So I'm very happy to take any questions and um, yeah, I can answer what I can. Um, feel free to take my contact detail. I'm happy to, to be in, in contact with you. Um, and I think the last slide um, is the links and resources. So perhaps I can put some of these links into the chat if you like. Yeah, I think that is it. That was just wonderful, uh, uh, Christine. I just love all those roofs. On the, on the picture, your first picture, where was that roof with all of the roofs? You could see them all over. Which city was that? The very opening slide? Yes. That was the convention center. Uh, no, with the one with all of the roofs all over the city. Oh, oh. Do you know what? That was Beirut. Yeah, I kind of thought it was. I know China is doing a lot like that. Yeah. Mm. And it certainly is the way to go. I'm sure other people have questions. Go ahead, uh, Lisa, you can monitor. Yeah, who has questions? <laughs> or is it all covered? Well, Christine, I have mason bees, and I've been doing that now for about two years, ever since the Langley Garden Club had the most incredible speaker come and talk about it, and also live as cocoons. And I now have, uh, three mason bee houses outside my kitchen window. So am I, am I doing a good thing or am I not doing a good thing? Oh, I didn't mean to imply that you weren't doing a good thing. You're doing a great thing if you're taking care of the nest boxes and... Yeah. Well, I lose the inserts, you know, the, so I, those come out with the cocoons and, and fresh ones are in there. And despite the cold weather, they're all very busy. They're filling up those, uh, those paper things. Um, but from what you're telling me, am I, again, am I doing the right thing here? Mm. I think you're doing a great thing, Leslie. And especially, you know, if you're enjoying them and you're yes. taking care of them. The, the, the risk is if, 
if you go away for the summer or maybe you go away for two years and you leave the oh. box out that's kind of it's the neglect um because of just the risk of pathogens yes. no no and that hasn't you know, happened yet <laughs> right yeah yeah and they're going in the garage for the winter right 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 yes there yeah no well done in the chat i don't know if you if you've seen those ones but Lionel asks, where can I find a list of native plants that offer pollen and or nectar to bees? Great question. Yeah, there should be a list, shouldn't there? I think <coughs> it's something that we've been intending to do. Dr. Ellie has quite an excellent list from UBC. Mm. She's done a lot of studies, Lionel. Um, if you, no, not UBC. Oh, no, might be SFU. Dr. Ellie, E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Yeah, Elizabeth Ellie. A yeah. great list of studies of what plants had the most native bees on them. I, I can try and find it for you, Lionel, and put it up. Yeah, I just put in the, the pollinator partnership link as well, which is something that um, Elizabeth Ellie was quite involved in. Perfect. That should be a lot of resources. There, Lionel. Uh, so another question from Anita. Do ground nesting bees hum? I no. wish I could say. What do you no. think? No, they don't. Oh, you know this? Well, I, I have a lot of bees that come to my garden. And I notice that what I consider to be a wild bee, they make no noise. Like the mason bees do not make any noise. And but bumblebees and honeybees do. Mm. Yes. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> yeah, right. That's your observation. That's great. Yes. I mean, I guess ground nesting bees, like uh bumblebees are ground nesters and they but they, they have do. that the, they buzz pollinate and they're yes. they can be pretty loud, can't they? The it, yes. Yes. Um, I've got a question. What is your opinion about the eastern bumblebee? Um, well, my understanding of the eastern bumblebee is um, that it's that it is displacing the western. So the the western bumblebee, um, Bombus occidentalis. Um, yeah, I don't know the exact status. Um, but I know that there's a concern about uh, population decline, uh, which is attributed to competition uh, from the Eastern. Okay. And of course the Eastern bumblebees were brought here uh, to pollinate greenhouses, right? So they're really popular um, in the greenhouses and uh, it shouldn't really be a surprise that they escaped. And now we're kind of gradually watching the, the population expand. Uh, and it does seem to correlate with a decline of the Western. Um, okay. Yeah, I hope it doesn't cause declines in other native bumblebees. Is anybody monitoring that? Um, so my colleague, Sarah Johnson, who was the founding president of the Native Bee Society, she's currently up in um, Bella Bella or Bella Coola doing her PhD research on bumblebees and she's she's already um a bumblebee expert um that being said i can't tell you exactly what if her work is relating to to that question okay yeah thank you thank you so i saw olivia asked a question can living roofs create ecological traps for bees yeah so that was um something I was interested in. Um, I set up a, a green roof experiment at BCIT with all native plants to um, um, actually Gary Oak Meadow, like classic, you know, dry, drought tolerant wildflower meadows. And um, that experiment didn't progress beyond one season. Uh, and what I've learned subsequently is that um, so first of all, cities tend to attract generalist species, 
you know, like we're not going to get the, the specialist bees that are unique to the Southern Okanagan. They're not going to find um, a living roof 700 kilometers or even 200 kilometers away, even 300 kilometers because small bees have a very small travel radius. It's the big bodied bees can travel far. Uh, so that's, that was the first sort of um, eye opener, you know, the field of dreams that if you build it, they will come like, oh, if I put a really unique uh, mariposa lily, will I suddenly get like the specialist bee? No, because they're, they're not going to get there. They, they live in the desert. <laughs> so there's a sort of, um, um, with regards to, so to that question that Olivia's asked about, um, can they become a sink, basically a population sink? Um, my sense is that they, that living roofs would not create a sink for bees, an ecological trap. And that's because they're pretty mobile. So if they, if they're already there, then probably where they came from isn't too far away or they're, they're fine with that. Um, where there is concern has been with ground nesting birds, actually, because uh, colleagues of mine in Switzerland were doing um, the research looking at supporting ground nesting birds with green roofs because a lot of birds will nest on green roofs. However, they discovered that if they didn't provide water uh, with some plants to attract insects for the little baby fledglings to eat, the babies would die. They would basically survive as long as their yolk could support them. And then they would perish because they had no other resources up there. So for birds, uh, and you can kind of imagine like a baby bird is quite different from a, a bee that got itself up there. So I'm just, that's just like my intuitive response uh, and what I, what I know from, from the literature. Um, yeah, that's a satisfactory answer. Thank you. Oh yes, yeah, and Camus is uh, available. I know Nat's Nursery sells Camus. Um, at different stages of growth as well. So you can actually buy them because um, you know the, the bulbs can be quite small when they're in their first year, but um, yeah, Camus is readily available. Awesome. Any more questions? Karen, you have a question? Yes, please. It's an observation um, recently on the property that I take care of. The lawn is patchy. It looks really ugly. And this year I noticed that there were like holes in it, in the patchy area. Um, nice little holes, uh, no evidence that it was a bird pecking in there. Um, no evidence of ants at all. I didn't see any ants in the area. So I was kind of wondering what made these holes? Uh, now that you mentioned bees, uh, I think I might set up out there and watch them for a while to see if it's bees, because in that case, if they're in there, I won't be, won't be touching that. I won't be improving it. Now, when are they most active? Like when would I see them going in or out most? Mm. So it'll probably depend on the day, mm -hmm. um, but you know, they're, they're little cold blooded creatures. So mm -hmm. they're pretty slow in the morning. Okay. And, you know, if you think about it, that's probably also why the burrows are exposed sand, right? They will get, when the sun rises, that, that mm -hmm. will kind of get them moving. Um, yeah, so if it's a rainy day, probably don't, don't bother. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, a warm day and like after the day's warmed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds like a really fun project. Okay. I want to come Thank to you. the next meeting so I can hear what you see. I'll let you know. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. Any more questions? I don't think I'm seeing any hands going up and of the folks that have their cameras open. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christine. I, I I feel that I might have more of a lazy lawn than a um, a healthy lawn. It it is crappy, but I got all those dandelions. So <laughs> maybe my neighbors have something when they tell me to mow my lawn. 
<laughs> I'll work on that. Um, I would like to note, um, actually, Elise is on here from Let's um, that we're having, we're hosting. I, I say we because I also work with Elise, but we're hosting a festival of the bees at the Derek Doubleday Arboretum next Saturday, the twenty eighth. And of course, everyone's welcome to come. And I'm sure Elise now has all sorts of new info to share with people. So thank you so much, Christine, for coming out. And uh, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Very enjoyable. Wonderful, Christine. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> and I, I guess, I guess we're done. And uh, hopefully, I'll get this recording up sooner rather than later. I know I have two past months that haven't gone up yet, but I'll work on it. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks thank so much you. for coming out. Happy B Day. Good day. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs>